Hello, it's Paul Ricci again. I, wait, let me go back to Zoom. Okay, and now I'm here with Allegheny, is that Allegheny Media, Independent Media has had its new, new uh, has, has its first interview of the year with the head of Stop Bombs for Liberty, you know, the group that's obviously against the group Moms for Liberty. So my guest is uh, Liz Mkhitaryan. Did I say it right? You did. Okay, and well, I will let her. Okay, I will. I will let her. Okay, I will let her have the floor, and then. So tell me a little bit about your group, Stomp Bombs for Liberty. Sure, uh, we came about obviously. Um, you know, as a response to the Moms for Liberty movement across the country. I'm actually in the county in Florida where Moms for Liberty was developed. Uh, I know the leaders personally, or one of them anyway. Um, and so we, you know, at first, or I at first tried to be very rational and speak with some of the local members and, you know, just say, you know, can't we work together and, and do some positive things for public schools if you want things to change? And instead of listening to someone who had been in the trenches, I'm a retired teacher, mm -hmm. um, they decided that they would uh, call me names and, you know, claim that I was supporting pedophilia and, you know, some pretty awful mm -hmm. stuff. So this was in um, 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, and at first, of course, I was, you know, kind of taken aback by all of that and couldn't figure out why, you know, such hate was, you know, prevalent. And then I started thinking, well, is this kind of like what they do is are other mm -hmm. teachers being attacked? And mm -hmm. sure enough, that is what I found out. And so our first group started in Brevard County, Florida, and we very quickly grew across the state of Florida where um, people were really appalled at some of the behavior and some of the things that Moms for Liberty members were doing. Um, and so I think it was North Carolina first reached out and said, hey, have you thought about you know, going outside of the state of Florida, because we have some issues here where, you know, they're disruptive going to school board meetings and casting all kinds of aspersions against teachers and against administrators in the public school system. And I said, well, I really hadn't planned on, you know, any of it, mm -hmm. but um, sure, we can try that. So the, that was the first state group that formed. And shortly thereafter, we have spread pretty much across the country. We are in about I think it's 46 states we have groups and we have currently over 14,000 members in the national group and then um, state level groups have formed and I don't even count the members that are in the state level groups. So we're pretty much probably around 20,000 people that are united across the country and are saying no, we believe in public school system and this, you know, defaming of teachers and, you know, just librarians and all of these things that we see that are going on. We are saying, no, that's not OK. That is not the approach. We're not saying that there aren't concerns. And of course, we would always seek for improvement of any system. But this attack mode was not acceptable from the very beginning. And so that's who we are. And um, we are basically a communication group so that we connect um, different spokes on the wheel. What I found when I was reaching out to see what was going on were, was that there were really good and solid things happening across the country to fight back. But what was missing was that communication piece because one county might be fighting what's going on. And yet the next county over didn't even know that, you know, there was something mm -hmm. going on. And so this was a communication tool that was developed so that people could support one another. And, um, and it's been pretty, pretty successful in its, in its own right. We are not a registered entity. 
We have nobody that's a salary, salaried employee. We, um, we have no money. <laughs> we don't mm -hmm. take donations. So yeah. it's purely a grassroots movement of people who are fed up and have said, no, this is not okay. And as we see in the news over and over again, these are some pretty bad people involved in a lot of what's going on with Moms for Liberty. And yeah. so we say, no, they're not going to be in charge of what happens for the rest of us. Okay. I mean, some of their, I guess you said some, of, I guess some of their members have been involved in some scandals, like Correct. doing the very thing they're railing against. Correct. Yep. So. And, and there have been things that have been exposed for, you know, we're going on two years now where that is not a truthful movement. It is certainly not about parent rights, even though that's what they claim. It is purely a movement that is to um, dismantle the public school system. And so they're very supportive of voucher programs, educational savings accounts, things that would actually hurt the bottom line of the public school system. And, and um, you know, those are all things that we're fighting against, that, that it's just not okay to have only those that can afford so to get an an education in this United States. Okay. So how, how large is your presence inside Pennsylvania? This is where I'm broadcasting from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Pennsylvania is actually one of our larger groups. We have, I think it's nearing 2000 members alone, just in Pennsylvania. And um, they were actually the first group that then divided out and, and did county level stop moms for Liberty groups. And I think currently there's about 20, two uh, or so counties that have okay. local organizing groups. And so okay. they discuss things like, you know, what will happen at their local school board meeting and, you know, the times and, and dates and so forth. Okay. So they drilled right down to the action type steps. Um, whereas at the national level, we do some calls to action, but it's more, um, uh, I guess, a broad approach. Whereas folks in county level groups can really drill in and, and do things that are specific to their area. Okay. Well, I'd like to show, I'd like to show, share the map, share a map, you know, like you say, looking at all the group, the stop, the moms for Liberty groups here mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania, even like how they've changed over the last few months. Yep. So I'll bring that up. So like this map here, maybe it's okay, maybe a little big. Let me try to okay, zoom out a little bit. So okay, mm -hmm. so you can see it. And yes, you can see, yes, these are in the more <clears throat> so they are primarily in the more populated areas. I mean, you do have one, let's say like this would be Erie, Pennsylvania. This is where mm -hmm. Pittsburgh is, and this is Philly. Yep. So, yes, I mean, even just going back to look at, here's a map. Here's a map I saved from their website. Yes, okay, there was one here. This is Blair County, Altoona, right next to where I live. So, so yes, you can see, yes, they are changing. Um, so I wonder, you know, like one of the steps for organizing, I just did a recent post looking at, say, poverty, you know, like, like, so generally, generally speaking, these are in maybe some of the more affluent areas of Pennsylvania, their chapters. Mm -hmm. you know, like one, one thing, I, you know, I don't know if they're trying to like, be you know, like in the more, in the more impoverished areas of Pennsylvania, like that might, that may or may not be a, be a fertile ground for them to organize. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, one thought I had, you know, yes, even though, it, well, especially it's ironically in the more impoverished areas is where you probably the, are generally the counties that have higher percentage of votes for Donald Trump and Mag, the Mag, you know, the MAGA movement is more prominent. Mm -hmm. So, so I wonder, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, do you see that in florida like do they try to organize more in, in mostly the affluent areas or the impoverished areas 
Um, I don't know that there's a specific pattern <laughs> that I have noticed. Um, Florida is kind of the outlier. Um, I call us the laboratory of what people can get away with. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard for me to, you know, do a comparison with the state of Florida. Um, the interesting part is I've looked at all those maps, like the one that you've just shown yeah. with where the mm -hmm. chapters are and so forth. And there's no information, at least that we've been able to decipher, that truthfully shows what kind of membership is involved with these chapters. There's no listing yeah. of, you know, mm -hmm. who's doing what and where. Yeah. And so our belief is that there's some, um, I'll just say some disingenuous um, type reporting going on so that there may be chapters, quote unquote, in counties right next to each other. Mm -hmm. but they may not be active chapters. They may have all the same members and mm -hmm. yet they're counted as two chapters. Um, okay. So there's kind of what we believe anyway is some fudging of the data um, when they say they have, you know, it's close to 300 um, mm -hmm. groups or something, you know, they, they try to tout those numbers. We're not really sure that that's actually the membership that's happening, um, particularly of note recently, um, I know in Pennsylvania, you had one group that moved away from Moms for Liberty um, over scandal and, and things like that. And um, it's overwhelming if you look at maps like that and say, oh, my gosh, look at everywhere where they are. But mm -hmm. we're really not sure that those are, you know, actively working mm -hmm. well um uh, you know, well-developed groups. They just are, you know, on a sheet of paper that mm -hmm. shows that they're part of a map. Yeah. So um, as far as pa uh, patterns, not really. I, I haven't really seen anything that's specific. Um, I think overall it is, um, it's probably more likely not necessarily affluent, but the more involved, almost like suburban type yeah. areas, um, they do have a tendency to have the parents that have the um, the ability to <clears throat> go to school board meetings, to organize, to do things of that nature. Whereas maybe um, in you know more, um, I'll even call it uh, maybe some disenfranchised areas. Um, that they don't necessarily have the time or the wherewithal to get together and organize in such a dramatic fashion. Um, so I don't know that I can hang my hat on saying that it's necessarily an economic situation, mm -hmm. but um, I, I think that Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. as you showed, there might be something to that argument. I have not personally, you know, looked really okay. deeply into that. Okay. And so generally speaking, their efforts, like in terms of book banning, has mm -hmm. been so like, would you say their efforts have been mostly like anything, any books that might be related to sex or race? Is that generally yep. the main thrust? Yes, um, it's by um, by a wide margin books that are of those topics, um, anything that's race related, anything that has any kind of um, sexual nature to it. And by saying that, it's about discussion of anything related within those topics. So they like to throw around the terms pornography and obscenity and, and things like that. But um, over and over again, it's being proven that there is no pornography in schools, that the books that they are referring to might have some passages in them that they found objectionable, but it's very disingenuous that they, you know, go before a school board and their, you know, their tactic is they read a salacious passage out loud and claim that, you know, teachers and librarians are handing pornography to children. But even by the Supreme Court, that's not how you define if something is obscene or not. You have to take the whole body of work as a whole and see if it has any literary mer merit, which pretty much every book that's in every library has literary merit. They just don't 
agree with that merit. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, overall, it's a pattern and a system of them causing this chaos. And they are costing places thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars with this process. And I'd say at least seven or eight times out of 10, books are not removed. But they've gone ahead and they've, you know, cost districts money, time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just sometimes a wild goose chase that that they're doing strategically to waste people's time. And I, I'm just, you know, I, I think that the whole book banning issue, which they say they're not banning, but our position is that they are book removing if they don't want to use that word banning, but they are definitely, you know, for the removal of books. Yeah. Um, and that's fundamentally something that we don't support. We would agree with, you know, age appropriateness of books. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have the same book in a kindergarten class as you would have in high school and vice versa. Yeah. But this attack mode of, oh, the schools are trying to indoctrinate, the schools are trying to um, feed our children pornography. It's just not the right approach to this at all. And so they have made lots of enemies over this approach that they've taken. It is really so bad that they developed their own website called booklooks.org. I don't know if you've um, been no, familiar with that. Um, and they have thousands and thousands and thousands of books where they've pulled out passages that can be deemed to be salacious. So these arguments, nine times out of 10, are coming from the connection to this Moms for Liberty backed uh, website called Book Looks. And it's just not right. You can't pull out a passage and just yeah. decide that something is, is uh, inappropriate. I mean, um, ulti so yes. Ultimately, is just like uh, people like now almost trying to control how our kids think. Yes. Yeah. You know, and, and another issue could be like, how does, you know, a more cash strapped school district might be more afraid to put something they might find objectionable in there, you know, for fear of lawsuits and mm -hmm. very expensive lawsuits. Well, and it, it's not even the lawsuits. It's prior to that. Because we've got people that are spending their days working on these book issues when there are vetting processes that are already in place with every school district on how mm -hmm. books and material are selected. And Moms for Liberty is showing that, oh, we just can't trust the people that are employed or the school system. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, we can't even um they've infiltrated book review committees and things of that nature so yeah. i mean it's it's not really about the books per se and it's not really about protecting children it's really about control and that's the piece that's frightening because it might be the issue of books now but what else is going to be decided by a small minority of people and that's what we strongly object to that Sure, you can have, you know, something that you object to, go through the process, fill out your forms, do your, um, you know, your paperwork to cast your objection. Don't go and defame an entire school district because there's something that you find objectionable. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think that is what their, their bottom line is and why they've even looked at the book situation. This wasn't always the focus of Moms for Liberty. It seems to be now. Um, their focus from the very get-go was to make public schools look bad. And I mean, there are enough, you know, errors within a school system that they don't need any help looking bad. We have our own mistakes and, and things that always need improvement. And so they've manufactured this whole layer of attack on public school educators and systems and um, it's all meant to drive people away and to undermine the trust in not only schools, but in teachers. And um, as a retired educator, that's pretty, pretty concerning. Um, the level of respect was not what it should be to begin with. 
And now to have these attacks come down the road, across the country, we're seeing shortages of educators. And I don't see it getting any better if Moms for Liberty is just allowed to, you know, keep pushing this whole diet dialogue of how bad the schools are and how bad teachers are. So, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess so. Generally speaking, would you say they have not generally gone after, say, books about the environment or climate change? Um, I'm sure that they have raised objections to multiple issues, but overall, yeah. the majority of books have uh, either LGBTQ plus uh, characters in them, mm -hmm. or they were written by someone from the community. And the same can be said for um, authors of color. Those mm -hmm. seem to be the majority of books that mm -hmm. they have um, been striving to get removed. And so they don't like to own up to that. But if you, you look at the overall, that is definitely a pattern. Um, and they don't want things like race to be discussed. And, you know, yeah. we keep saying, what are they so afraid of? You yeah. know, and discussion is never something that you should be afraid of. And yes, we agree. It should be age appropriate. You shouldn't be talking about, you know, the, the most extreme parts of slavery to five-year-olds. However, that is history. And you can't alter the history. So, you know, it's up to us to share that history and to teach, you know, accurate information about things like the LGBTQ plus community and mm -hmm. about, you know, gender issues and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so interesting because they talk about the, um, I guess they call it the, uh, the gender agenda. You know, they, mm -hmm. they like to, put all these little hashtag names on everything yeah. and what's actually happening across the country, which is where their assault should really be is a more generalized attack on society. They don't like the changes that they are seeing within society. All mm -hmm. public schools have done is answer to society's needs and the changes in society are what people are objecting to. It's not that schools are pushing LGBTQ plus community or race issues. That's part of our society. And so isn't that the, the onus of a public education system is to address mm -hmm. the needs of a community, whatever those needs may be. Certainly. Okay. So I know like, yes, I have written a lot about, about how um, Ron DeSantis has been, you know, you know, he started like working to ban woke curriculum. So did Ron DeSantis efforts to ban curricula and, you know, like ban books, did, did that come before Moms for Liberty was founded or, or did they work together in tandem? Yeah, it's pretty much hand in hand. Um, you've heard about the laws and everything that have been passed in Florida. The the don't say gay one mm -hmm. was really the big one. That's just a, a name for the the actual law. And Monster Liberty was at that governor's side when these things were drafted. Um, mm -hmm. So it's been hand in hand um, without going into all the details of this whole scandal here in Florida with the Ziegler's. Um, mm -hmm the husband in the Ziegler situation was chair of the Republican party in the state of Florida. Uh -huh. And he's quoted as saying, Oh, moms for Liberty will be our foot soldiers to get people to come and join the Republican party and to support DeSantis and so forth. And, and so that has definitely worked hand in hand. Um, they were not as active during his first term, but certainly the growth of moms for Liberty um, while he was in office and then, you know, him kind of putting his talons into that group and mm -hmm. that group putting their talons into him. Uh, it has definitely been a win-win situation for the two. And it, it's interesting, too, because part of Moms for Liberty are Trump supporters and part are Ron DeSantis supporters. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting to see that kind of play mm -hmm. out in this presidential campaign, um, mm -hmm. whereas even within their own membership, they're not united behind you know one of the candidates especially last night in iowa yes so 
so yeah it was uh i mean you know i guess i guess the two two of them counted accounted for about 70 percent of the vote in iowa right. so right. so yes so so do they generally have a preference between ron DeSantis or donald trump would you say i think it's pretty divided um there are some diehard Trump supporters within <laughs> and MAGA supporters within the Moms for Liberty organization. And there are also some very supportive people of DeSantis. And so, you know, I'd love to be a fly on the wall at some of their meetings when they have members that are, are so, um, so different in their approach to things, you know, related to that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know if it's a 50, 50 split or, you know, what have you, but, um, it, it as a, an entity, they definitely lean more towards the Republican yeah. party overall, well, although they like to say that they are, um, nonpartisan. We know that that's not true. Okay. I know. Well, I do know, of course, Ron DeSantis, he's tried to emulate a lot of Trump's policies and, <clears throat> you know, he doesn't really criticize Trump. Because he obviously he wants he wants his he, he's hoping Trump's people will vote for him. Right. Excuse me, a little frog in my throat, and you know. So I mean, I know getting back to the teaching part. I mean, mm -hmm. I've noticed like you know I I did write about uh, you know his banning of math textbooks in Florida right. that he some of them he thought were too were too woke. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm a teacher, too. I've taught statistics and, mm -hmm. you know, obviously it's better to use teaching examples that your students can relate to. Right. In the classroom, you know, obviously they don't care like how many balls you put in an urn or uh, in an urn and how many, you know, like looking at probabilities and all that. It's probably better to use maybe like sports statistics or basketball uh or something they can relate to. I mean, just getting back to the representativeness side of it. Yep. So hopefully that, that is the, the goal of getting trying to engage with the students and getting them interested in things like math or so mm -hmm. but just out of curiosity, what, what, what was your, what did you teach? Uh, I was a kindergarten teacher for many, many years. Okay. So yes, certainly very challenging and <laughs> You know, obviously, this is, you could argue, this is where indoctrination can begin. Either, either, well, I mean, depending on what you're indoctrinating someone for. Right, you know, right. I mean, it can, and, be, good. It can be good, it can be bad. Well, and it, it's <laughs> interesting because I don't think that they understand a lot of the terms that they like to throw around. Mm -hmm. They certainly do not understand what woke is. Woke was, you know, stolen from the black community mm -hmm. and, you know, they throw it around like it's an insult. It's really not. Um, they talk about indoctrination as mm -hmm. if it's, you know, this horrible mind control thing. Um, I indoctrinated children as a kindergarten teacher to write their names, to, you know, flush mm -hmm. when they go to the bathroom, <laughs> you know, everything yeah. in the sun it's teaching. It's not indoctrinate. And they just, you know, have come up with these terms and these terms are, are being used strategically. The, um, the, the use of throwing around CRT was all developed by one man, um, mm -hmm. Christopher Rufo, who decided that, Ooh, this sounds like a boogeyman. I'm going to make everything related to race be labeled under this CRT indoctrination label and create fear across the country when in fact, you know, CRT has never been an issue within, you know, any K through 12 school yeah. system. So. Well, I mean, it, it just goes to show like how easy it is to, how easy it is to start these, this kind of fear mongering, you know, it's exactly. easier, how easy it is compared yeah. to, you know, calmly explaining what's going on and, like why, why this is important. And mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And again, I mean, I, I'm in one little vein of me is, you know, happy that people are this involved in public schools. However, <laughs> 
the involvement is not what is needed because this this whole thing with Moms for Liberty is not to improve the public school system. It's to destroy it. And, mm. you know, that that can't be something that the majority of people of the country support and they don't. And so that's what we're seeing unfold is that as people are becoming really kind of just um, tired of the constant attacks, they want it to stop. They want, you know, schools to be boring and school board meetings to be boring again. And that's not the purpose of this quote unquote parents rights movement. It is to create chaos. It's not to solve any kind of problems. Mm -hmm. Or distract from real problems. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. And um, so, so yes. I, okay. Well, I'd be happy to, well, I'm very happy you took the time to speak with me. And it's a very, certainly an important subject, something I'm, I'm an educator yeah. too. So I, I certainly feel passionate about. So, um, okay, and so I guess, well, we'll see. I mean, so would you say, like, with, with going back, getting back to the presidential race, like, so are generally people, would you say, the, I guess, the Moms for Liberty crowd, are they generally less, less keen on someone like Nikki Haley? I mean, um, no, I wouldn't say that necessarily. I think she has a following within Moms for Liberty as well. She was one of their guest speakers at their national summit in Philly uh, this past mm -hmm. summer. Um, and she she is definitely in favor of Moms for Liberty and the actions that they are taking. Um, so she's, I guess, as um, equally scary of a candidate as any yeah. of the other. Well, she did equivocate on whether or not... Uh, whether or not you know the civil liber the civil war i say which was about slavery yeah yeah okay well let's see we have about 5 minutes to go okay that pretty much was all the questions i had for you is there anything else you would like to bring up no um i would just encourage any of your um, viewers or listeners that you know we're not alone in our thinking um, the majority of people want to eliminate any kind of book banning that's going on. The majority of people in this country are supportive of a public school system. That's not to say that it's perfect, but mm -hmm. they believe that it needs to exist in this country. Mm -hmm. And we are uniting across the country to say enough of the attacks, enough. There are plenty of ways for parents and for groups to be involved. Mm -hmm. And if it's not on this attack mode, then maybe we can sit at a table and come up with some problem solving if there are issues that people have. But that's not what that movement is about. It's not about problem solving. Mm -hmm. It is about control. It is about takeover. And it is about moving public dollars into a private school setting, into a charter school setting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those or, or things home, or homeschooling homeschooling for crying out loud in the state of florida um we're all about you know leading the the way quote unquote in education and our um voucher system was expanded to then be allowed to be used for homeschooling which is happening across the country i think in various places it's happened here and it's being done with no accountability whatsoever so in Florida, we have things like families receiving this money from the state and buying passes to Disney World, season passes. So, you know, there's there's something to be said for keeping public money under the control of public entities. And even if someone is not uh, interested in public schools or any of this that is going on, they need to be interested in where their tax dollars are going. And if, you know, they want to pay their tax money to, quote unquote, pay for education, I would think that even every member would want to know where that money is going and if they are getting their money's worth out of it. And with no accountability built into play, it, it's a dangerous scenario to have vouchers run rampant and, you know, this um, 
this ability to have my tax dollars go to pay for someone else's, you know, Christian and uh, or um, other religious based education. You know, there's uh, a lot of issues involved with what's going on with public education and it's worth fighting for. So we have, well, we have about two minutes left. So like if you just would like to give all the contact information for Stop Moms for Liberty. So sure. Well, we have a strong presence on Facebook. That's kind of where we launched. Um, And it's, you know, if you search Stop Moms for Liberty, you can come up with multiple chapters across the country that people can join and see what's going on. Um, We have a national group as well. That's the large group that shares information and, um, you know, connects all the spokes on the wheel. And then we have a website, www.stopmomsforliberty.com that um, we would love to have people, you know, investigate and find out what we're doing to fight back. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop recording and well, uh, okay.